Hi everyone, welcome back to Pages of the Globe. Today I'm going to be reading to you the short story, How to Become a Writer, by Loris Moore. Before we start, like always, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the author, and then we're going to jump straight into the story. So, Lori Moore was born on January 13th, 1957, and she is an American writer, critic, and essayist. She is best known for her short stories, some of which have won, that have won major awards. Since 1984, she has also taught creative writing. Now, Moore won the 1998 Or Henry Award for her short story, People Like That Are Only People Here, published in The New Yorker on January 27, 1997. She was also named the winner of the Irish Times International Fiction Prize for Birds of America. She has received many other prizes other than that, but if we want to talk a little bit about her academic career, she does teach creative writing, as I said before. So she has taught at Cornell University as the Sydney Harmon Writer in Residence at Barrow College and the at the MFA in Creative Writing Program at the University of Michigan, as well as Princeton and NYU, all incredibly prestigious colleges. Without further ado, let's get on with the story. Remember to like, share, subscribe, and comment down below which short story you would like to read next. How to Become a Writer by Lori Moore First, try to be something, anything else. A movie star, astronaut, a movie star, missionary, a movie star, kindergarten teacher, president of the world, fail miserably. It's best if you fail at an early age, say 14. Early critical disillusionment is necessary so that at 15 you can write long haiku sequences about thwarted desire. It is a palm, a cherry blossom, a wind brushing against a sparrow wing leaving for mountain. Count the syllables. Show it to your mom. She is tough and practical. She has a son in Vietnam and a husband who may be having an affair. She believes in wearing brown because it hides spots. She'll look briefly at your writing and then back up at you with a face blank as a donut. She'll say, how about emptying the dishwasher? Look away. Shove the forks back in the fork drawer. Accidentally break one of the freebie gas station glasses. This is the required pain and suffering. This is only for starters. In your high school English class, look only at Mr. Killian's face. Decide faces are important. Write a villanelle about pores. Struggle. Write a sonnet. Count the syllables. 9, 10, 11, 13. Decide to experiment with fiction. Here, you don't have to count syllables. Write a story about an elderly man and woman who accidentally shoot each other in the head. The result of an inexplicable malfunction of a shotgun, which appears mysteriously in their living room one night. Give it to Mr. Killian as your final project. When you get it back, he has written on it. Some of your images are nice, but you have no sense of plot. When you're at home in the privacy of your own room, faintly scrawl in pencil beneath his black inked comment. Plots are for dead people, poor face. Take all the babysitting jobs you can get. You're great with kids. They love you. You tell them stories about old people who die idiot deaths. You sing them songs like Bluebells in Scotland, which is their favorite. And when they are in their pajamas, finally, and have finally stopped pinching each other when they are fast asleep, you read every sex manual in the house and wonder how on earth anyone could ever do those things with somebody they truly loved. Fall asleep in a chair reading Mr. McFurphy's Playboy. When the McMurphys come home, they will tap you on your shoulder, look at the magazine in your lap, and grin. You will want to die. They will ask you if Tracy took her medicine, all right. Explain yes, she did, and that you promised her a story if she would take it like a big girl, and that seemed to work out fine. Oh, marvelous, they will explain. Try to smile proudly. Apply to college as a child psychology major. As a psychology major, you have some electives. You've always liked birds. Sign up for something called the ornithological field trip. It meets Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2. When you arrive at room 134 on the first day of class, everyone is sitting around a seminar table talking about metaphors. You've heard one of these. After a short excruciating while, raise one of your hands and say diffidently, excuse me, isn't this bird watching 101? The class stops and turns to look at you. They seem to all have one face, giant and blank as a vandalized clock. Someone with a beard booms out, no, this creative writing. Say, oh, right, as if perhaps you knew all along. Look down at your schedule. Wonder how the hell you ended up here. 
The computer apparently has made an error. You start to get up and leave, then don't. The lines at the register this week are huge. Perhaps you should stick with this mistake. Perhaps your creative writing isn't all that bad. Perhaps it is fate. Perhaps this is what your dad meant when he said, It's the age of computers, Francie. It's the age of computers. Decide that you like college life. In your dorm, you meet many nice people. Some are smarter than you, and some, you notice, are dumber than you. You will continue, unfortunately, to view the world in those exact terms for the rest of your life. The assignment this week in creative writing is to narrate a violent happening, turn in a story about driving with your uncle Gordon, and another one about two people who are accidentally electrocuted when they go to turn on a badly wired desk lamp. The teacher will hand them back to you with comments. Much of your writing is smooth and energetic. You have, however, a ludicrous notion of plot. Write another story about a man and a woman who in the very first paragraph have their lower torsos accidentally blitzed away by dynamite and the second paragraph with the insurance money they buy frozen yogurt stand together there are six more paragraphs you read the whole thing out loud in class no one likes it they say your sense of plot is outrageous and incompetent after class someone asks you if you're crazy decide that perhaps you should stick to comedies start dating someone who is funny and someone who has what in high school you called a really great sense of humor and what now your creative writing class calls self-contempt giving rise to comic form. Write down all his jokes, but don't tell him you're doing this. Make up anagrams of his old girlfriend's name and name all your socially handicapped characters with them. Tell him his old girlfriend is in all your stories and then watch how funny he can be and see what really great sense of humor he can have. Your child psychology advisor tells you you are neglecting courses in your major. What you spend most of the time on should be what you're majoring in. Say yes, you understand. Creative writing seminars over the next two years, everyone continues to smoke cigarettes and ask the same things. But does it work? Why should we care about this character? Have you earned this cliche? These seem like important questions. On days when it is your turn, you look at the class, hopefully, as they scour your mimographs for a plot. They look back up at you, drag deeply, and then smile in a sweet sort of way. You spend too much time slouched and demoralized. Your boyfriend suggests cycling. Your roommate suggests a new boyfriend. You are said to be self-mutilating and losing weight, but you continue writing. The only happiness you have is writing something new in the middle of the night, armpits damp, heart pounding, something no one has seen yet. You only have those brief, fragile, untested moments of exhilaration when you know you are a genius. Understand what you must do. Switch majors. The kids in your nursery project will be disappointed, but you have a calling, an urge, a delusion, an unfortunate habit. What you have, as your mother would say, is fallen in with a bad crowd. What they write, where does writing come from? These are the questions to ask yourself. They are like, where does dust come from? Or why is there war? Or if there is a god, then why is my brother now a cripple? These are questions that you keep in your wallet, like calling cards. These are questions your creative writing teacher said are good to address in your journals, but rarely in fiction. The writing professor this fall is stressing the power of imagination, which means he doesn't want long descriptive stories about your camping trip last July. He wants you to start in a realistic context, but then to alter it, like recombinant DNA. He wants you to let your imagination sail, to let it grow big-bellied in the wind. This is a quote from Shakespeare. Tell your roommate your great idea, your exercise of imaginative power, a transformation of Melville to contemporary life. It will be about monomania and the fishy fish world of life insurance in Rochester, New York. The first line will be, call me fish meal, and it will feature a menopausal suburban husband named Richard, who, because he is so depressed all the time, is called Mopey Dick by his witty wife, Elaine. Say to your roommate, Mopey Dick, get it? Your roommate looks at you, her face blank as a large Kleenex. She comes up to you like a buddy and puts her hand around your burdened shoulders. Listen, Francie, she says, slow as speech therapy. Let's go out and get a beer. The seminar doesn't like this one either. You suspect they're beginning to feel sorry for you. They say, you have to think about what is happening. Where is the story here? The next semester, the writing professor is obsessed with writing from personal experience. You must write from what you know, from what has happened to you. He wants death. He wants camping trips. 
Think about what has happened to you. In the three years, there have been three things. You lost your virginity, your parents got divorced, and your brother came home from a forest 10 miles from the Cambodian border with only half a thigh, a permanent smirk nestled in one corner of his mouth. About the first time you write, it's created a new space which hurt and cried in a voice that wasn't mine. I'm not the same anymore, but I'll be okay. By the second time you write an elaborate story about an old married couple who stumble upon an unknown landmine in their kitchen and accidentally blow themselves up. You call it for better or for liver worst. About the last you write nothing. There are no words for this. Your typewriter hums. You can find no words. At undergraduate cocktail parties, people say, oh, you write? What do you write about? Your roommate who has consumed too much wine, too little cheese and no crackers at all. Oh my God, she blurts. Oh my God, she always writes about her dumb boyfriend. Later on in life, you will learn that writers are merely open, helpless texts with no real understanding of what they have written and therefore must half believe anything and everything that is said of them. You, however, have not reached the stage of literary criticism. You stiffen and say, I do not. Same way you said it when someone in fourth grade accused you of really liking playing oboe lessons and your parents really weren't just making you take them. Insist you are not very interested in any one subject at all, that you are interested in the music of language, that you are interested in, in syllables, because they are the atoms of poetry, the cells of the mind, the breath of the soul. Begin to feel woozy. Stare into your plastic wine cup. Syllables, you will hear someone ask, voice trailing off as they glide slowly toward the white of the dip. Begin to wonder what you do write about. Or if you have anything to say, or if there is any such thing as a thing to say. Limit these thoughts to no more than 10 minutes a day, like sit-ups. They can make you thin. You will read somewhere that all writing has to do with one's genitals. Don't dwell on this, it will make you nervous. Your mother will come visit you. She will look at the circles under your eyes and hand you a brown book with a brown briefcase on the cover. It is entitled, How to Become a Business Executive. She has also brought Names for Baby Encyclopedia you asked for. One of your characters, the aging clown school teacher, needs a new name. Your mother will shake her head and say, Francie, Francie, remember when you were going to be a child psychology major? Say, Mom, I'd like to write. She'll say, Sure, you'd like to write. Of course, sure, you'd like to write. Write a story about a confused music student and title it, Schubert was the one with the glasses, right? It's not a big hit, although your roommate likes the part where the two violinists accidentally blow themselves up in the recital room. I went out with a violinist once, she says, snapping her gum. Thank God you are taking other courses. You could find sanctuary in the 19th century, ontological snags, and invertebrate courting rituals. Certain globular mollusks have what is called sex by the arm. The male octopus, for instance, loses the end of one arm while placing inside the female during intercourse. Marine biologists call it seven heaven. Be glad you know these things. Be glad you are not just a writer. Apply to law school. From here on thing, from here on in, many things can happen. But the main one will be this. You decide not to go to law school after all and decide instead you spend a big chunk of your adult life telling people how you decide not to go to law school after all. Somehow you end up writing again. Perhaps you go to graduate graduate school. Perhaps you work odd jobs and take writing courses at night. Perhaps you are working on a novel and writing down all the clever remarks and intimate personal confessions you hear during the day. Perhaps you are losing your pals, your acquaintances, your balance. You have broken up with your boyfriend. You now go out with men who, instead of whispering, I love you, shout, do it to me, baby. This is good for your writing. Sooner or later, you have a finished manuscript, more or less. People look at it in a vaguely troubled sort of way and say, I bet becoming a writer was always a fantasy of yours, wasn't it? Your lips try to salt. Say that all the fantasies possible in the world, you can't imagine being a writer, even making the top 20. Tell them you were going to be a child psychology major. I bet, they always sigh, you'd be great with kids. Scowl fiercely, tell them you're a walking blade. Quit classes, quit jobs, cash in old saving bonds. Now you have time like warts on your hands. Slowly copy all of your friends' addresses into a new address book. Vacuum, chew cough drops, keep a folder full of fragments. An eyelid darkening sideways, world as conspiracy, possible plot? A woman gets on a bus. Suppose you threw a love affair and nobody came. At home, drink a lot of coffee. At Howard 
Johnson's or the coleslaw. Consider how it looks like soggy and fun- the soggy confetti of a map. Where you've been, where you are going, you are here, says the red star on the back of the menu. Occasionally, a date with the face as blank as a sheet of paper asks you whether writers often become discouraged. Say that sometimes they do and sometimes they do. Say it's a lot like having polio. Interesting, smiles your date, and then he looks down at his arm hairs and starts to smooth them, all, always in the same direction. All right, so that was How to Become a Writer by Lori's Moore. Now, like always, um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview, and then we're going to jump straight into the analysis of the story. So, Lori's, Lori Moore's story, How to Become a Writer, is the story of Francie and her forays into the world of writing. The story is told as a guide to becoming a writer, How to Become a Writer, which depicts the story of just Francie becomes a writer almost on accident. It starts off with Francie's first attempts at writing poetry, in which she is kind of just brushed off by her mother. We then follow her to school writing, um, to a school writing class where she is told that she has no idea about plot. Francie then just switches gears and decides to try her luck with children, as she is told that she is good with them. It's children that she ends up going to college to to study at, only to end up in a writing class by accident. It is in this class that she is once told again that she has no idea what a plot is. Now, after just a series of kind of awful stuff that just happens to her, she graduates from college and decides to take on writing as a full-time endeavor. She spends most of her time writing things that she doesn't finish and has never looked back. Now, basically in the story, what we're just depicting, it depicts Francie and her various attempts to become a writer, albeit in a very, like, passive manner. She's basically, she was trying to become a child psychologist and ends up in her first writing class by absolute accident. It is through inventive perspective syntax and irony that Lori Moore's story, How to Become a Writer, satirizes yet presents the steps of becoming a writer. For the majority of the story, it appears that Francie is the main character. However, depending on how one looks at it, it's possible that Francie is just merely a puppet used to express the narrator's wishes, or that Francie is an anecdotal character created for the narrator's tale to tell us. How to Become a Writer uses perspective in a very unique manner. It's being told to what, like, it appears in kind of third person, but it's actually a first person narrative with the speaker speaking in the second person. It's basically almost all POVs used together at the same time. Using this, perspective the main character serves as not only the lead but also as an example to what will occur when one follows the step the voice tells us to do obviously this is complete satire and it's supposed to be like kind of dry humor which it definitely does end up coming off as this is moore's use of satire syntax irony and most especially perspective that makes how to become a writer the brilliant work of fiction that it actually is Moore takes what could become a very dry and dull idea because in the end, what is this even about? It's just about Francie and her kind of awful and suckish life. But she takes this and she kind of turns into a witting, witty and interesting story. Almost the entire time, the writer is kind of at the edge of their seat trying to see, okay, but is she going to end up succeeding? Is she going to succeed? Is she going to succeed? And when she finally doesn't, it's just like the reader has created a bond with the main character at this point. Where if writing in another manner, it kind of just would have made Francie seem like this pathetic and mockable kind of girl who's just doing things and she doesn't even understand what she's doing half the time. Which, yeah, she doesn't. But in this case, the way that it was written, it really does make her seem like more of kind of an amusing, determined girl who can who really just knows how to capture an audience anyway that is it for today remember to like share subscribe and comment down below which short story you would like to read next